Good afternoon and welcome to the latest edition of the Blood Red podcast. I'm Richard Garnett from the Liverpool Echo. And if you're anything like me, then the countdown is well and truly on. It's 11 days till Christmas, but of course, that's not what I'm talking about. We're just 12 days away from the restart of the Premier League season and only eight days away from Liverpool's tasty Carabao Cup tie at Manchester City. Uh, Liverpool are currently preparing for the season's restart with practice matches in Dubai. They're competing in the Dubai Super Cup. But in case you hadn't noticed, there is a World Cup going on at the moment, which has involved several players from Liverpool's squad. So I'm delighted to say that we're now joined by uh, TalkSport commentator Nigel Adley, who is on the ground in, in Qatar. Uh, good afternoon, Nigel. How are you doing? I'm fine, Richard. How are you? I'm not too bad, mate. Suffering a bit with uh, a cold here. It's very icy here. Back in England. Uh, it's not icy here, I have to say. No, I was going to say, I'm not quite sure what's happened with our careers, really. But here I am stuck in a box room <laughs> uh, with a lemsip. Um, a bit grab sounded a bit like Barry White. Uh, and you're in the Middle East in what looks like a Hawaiian shirt. Um, uh, is, the, is the temperature <laughs> to, to your needs? It, it's been very good here. I mean, the weather-wise, it's been fantastic. Um, I mean, it's about 25 degrees today. We're ahead of you, so we're, the sun will be going down in around an hour's time. But we're, we're looking forward to the, the second semi-final coming up this evening after the messy show last night. And in terms of the weather and the logistics, it's been, you know, a, a very good World Cup to cover. Of course, there are the, the broader issues, which... I don't think have gone away. I think we're seeing a version of Qatar here, which the authorities want us to see. And, and, it, and I think it's very, very different to how life is normally. But but the World Cup bubble is still very much intact here at the moment. Well, we'll, we'll move on to Liverpool stuff uh, uh, more centrically in a minute, because obviously this is a Liverpool podcast. But um, just expanding on that a little bit, from a, from a media point of view and from a journalist perspective um obviously you've been out there since the start of the world cup and uh you've under, you've covered previous major tournaments like this so how how well have you, have you been treated and, and what's the infrastructure been like in that respect well having everything around the same city has been great from a journalistic point of view because in previous world cups and european championships if you're covering press conferences you you're heading into the countryside to cover one team then you're heading across to another a city in another part of a country to to cover another. Here, all of the pre-match press conferences have been in the same place, in the same room, in the International Broadcast Centre. So guys have been sat there covering six or seven teams a day, which is very different. And, and travel-wise, the metro system here, which they've set up, has been very good. Driverless trains taking you, in some cases, to the doorstep of the stadium. And... It's been very easy to get around. So from the, the point of view of of getting to the stadiums, which have all been superb and, and covering the teams, it, it has been very good. Uh, there have been one or two issues. We've seen colleagues wearing rainbow T-shirts and rainbow badges stopped outside stadiums. The same thing has happened to fans. The Welsh fans who were here, some of them are wearing rainbow bucket hats and they have problems getting into the grounds. So I, I think that... The normal mindset, if I can put it like that, is not too far away from the surface. But at the moment, I think we have seen Qatar and the authorities try to put on a show. In some cases, I think it's forced. They've been saying the stadiums are full to, full to capacity, when at times they haven't been. And I'm sure they will say it's been the most successful World Cup ever. And you can have your view on that. But what is for sure, we've seen some real shocks. We've seen some real jeopardy on the field. And from a football fan's point of view, maybe that's what you want to see. Yeah, no, certainly no shortage of, of drama. And as you say, plenty of upsets, which which adds to the whole spectacle, doesn't it? Um, what Which uh, games have you actually covered then whilst you've been out there? Because you've been covered a few different sides, haven't you? Yeah, I went out here covering Wales. So obviously that didn't happen too, too long. Um, but I've been very fortunate to see some great games. I, I saw Morocco beat Spain in the quarterfinals on Saturday night. That was tremendous. I mean, the, the Moroccan fans are magnificent. They and the Tunisians, along with the Argentinians, have been the best here. And I was out in the souk uh, in the middle of Doha having some dinner last night, and it was absolutely packed with Moroccan fans. I, I think they will have 40,000 inside the stadium tonight, and the French will have about 3,000. So it will be like another home game. Um, I mean, it's been great to see Messi play in the flesh for the first time in a long time and maybe the final time on this sort of stage 
in his career. And it's it's just lovely to see so many different footballing cultures because wherever you look, there are fans from every nation here, whether they are genuinely from that nation or whether they're people from other parts of the world who are wearing that particular coloured shirt. In some cases, we're not too sure, but we have had that mix of cultures you always get at World Cups and it, and it's been really good to experience that. And I've seen some of the big teams perform well. I've seen Japan cause one or two upsets. And it, it has been a memorable World Cup from that point of view. Uh, and I think that if Morocco can beat the French this evening, that would just basically put the seal on, on what has been the Underdogs World Cup. Yeah, I, I certainly wouldn't totally rule that. I'll, either the way they're playing at the moment, they seem to have no fear in what they do and, uh, and attack things uh, in, in an entertaining way, which seems to have inspired the supporters and, and people watching as well. So that, that will definitely be uh, something that can't be ruled out. So if only England could have done a job on them, but we'll, we'll come to that now, really. So uh, certainly from a Liverpool perspective, they have got about six or seven players that have been involved in this tournament. If we, if we start with England, though, um, where we had uh, Jordan Henderson, Liverpool captain, and Trent Alexander-Arnold. Um, before the tournament, you, you could have argued you may have expected uh, Alexander-Arnold to be the one who got more minutes, but uh, it turned out to be the complete opposite. And uh, if anything, uh, Jordan Henderson may have given a few people a few reminders of, of, of how important he actually is to uh, to the fabric of, of not just a squad, but also a first 11. What, what were your, your own thoughts on Henderson first uh, and his World Cup? I thought he was one of the England players who probably will come out of this with his international career enhanced once again, coming towards the end of it. Because it, when he came into the team, there were one or two grumbles in the media and also on social media as well people outside of, of the Liverpool fan base saying, why is Jordan Henderson the answer yet again? And the reason is, it's because in that sort of team and the way that Southgate wants to play, he gives you that platform to allow maybe the more expansive talents to flourish. And I thought Henderson, when he was on the field, was probably one of England's better players. He was certainly a great fall foil for uh, Bellingham to play so well because he just gave him that security. And of course, he popped up with a goal against Senegal and in the French game, he, he really bottled things up for England. When England were on top in that game, it was because players like Jordan Henderson were winning the ball back and not allowing the French to really build attacks themselves. So he, he probably came into this World Cup thinking he may be a bit of a Connor Cody type figure, possibly not a cheerleader, but somebody who was going to be around the squad. But, but I think he's leaving this World Cup showing once again what a good player he can be at the highest level. Do you think that could have a, a, a knock-on effect on uh, how he might perform in the second part of the season for Liverpool as well? Because he hasn't been an automatic starter for Jurgen Klopp this season. Uh, there's been a bit of an imbalance in that midfield. There's no secret that Liverpool probably need fresh blood in there or younger legs that have been getting outrun in certain uh, in certain games against uh, supposedly lesser sides. And in some sense, Henderson's been the fall guy there. But then you go and see his performances alongside Rice and Bellingham and all of a sudden you think, hang on, maybe he's not the problem. Yeah, because irrespective of how you play, you need to keep the ball. And from a Liverpool point of view, if, if Thiago isn't available all the time, then Henderson, I think, is the sort of player who can do that. And the reason that England were able to perform so well was because Henderson was getting on the ball and he was also orchestrating attacks. I think in, in the French game, the problem was Declan Rice wasn't exploiting the good work that Henderson was doing because you had Henderson and Bellingham almost pushing wide to try and create spaces and forcing Rabiot and Charmaine wide. And there was a huge gap in the middle for Declan Rice to, to force forward and really try and link up with the England attack. But Rice was quite conservative and Rice sort of stayed where he was. So there was a big, a big space there which England weren't able to capitalise on. And that wasn't because of what Jordan Henderson was doing. I thought Jordan, Jordan Henderson wasn't a defensive presence necessarily, but he kept the ball so well and he still got the energy, he still got the legs at the very highest level, as he showed here. And I don't think the French enjoyed playing against him at all. And I think he will come back to Liverpool now and he can say, well, look, you look at how I played in that system in the World Cup and, and I could still do a job and, and if we need somebody who can just hold on to the ball and, and maybe even offer something a bit more going forward, he can be the player that maybe he was two or three years ago. 
What about Trent Alexander-Arnold then? Because um, coming into this tournament, he, he, there was some, uh, well, plenty of speculation that he might not even make it into Gareth Southgate's squad with the uh, uh, conundrum he has in the right-back uh, position with a, a wealth of talent. But obviously, Reese James never made it. And <clears throat> all of a sudden, he was a, an automatic shoe-in then, really. But um, didn't really get a chance to show what he could do. Uh, I did wonder if he might come on late against France, but but that wasn't to be. And is that I don't know, is it is it an opportunity missed for Trent? Well, he's been in two World Cup squads now, yeah. and the World Cups have really passed him by. Of course, four years ago, he was a real youngster in the team. He, he was barely established in, in the Liverpool team. And I think he almost went there for the experience. And I think he benefited from that, looking at his performances uh, between 2018 and, and certainly 2021. Um, here, I think he could have had more of a role to play, but but the way that Gareth Southgate was playing, I think he trusted Trippier more, possibly in a defensive sense, when they had the back four. And then, of course, up against Kylian Mbappe, he went for Carl Walker. And the way that Carl Walker played, I don't think you could really argue with that decision because Mbappe was, was kept very quiet in that game. The problem was there was so much room for Griezmann and, and the other players around the midfield, they were the ones that caused the, the, the damage. And, and I think that Alexander-Arnold will come away thinking, was a bit of a cameo in the group stage really enough for him? Probably not. But it's the way it is at the moment. And the way he's, he's performed for Liverpool has, has possibly pushed him down the pecking order with England. Or, or certainly that the way he's, his performances have been perceived. And, and, and Trippier and Walker are ahead of him now because... England have played at times, I wouldn't say with the handbrake on, because at this World Cup, I don't think they did. But they've, they've found a way of getting players into the team who do offer them that more defensive security. And, and, and maybe Trent isn't the sort of player that Gareth Southgate is looking for at the moment. But that doesn't mean he doesn't have a future in this England team moving forward, particularly if Gareth Southgate chooses to move on. Yeah, absolutely. And if uh, Trent wasn't able to uh, do too much of a job on the pitch, he certainly did uh, a fairly decent one off the pitch in terms of trying to schmooze Jude Bellingham, who um, <laughs> has, uh, very quickly emerged as uh, the star performer for England at this World Cup, and, and, and justifiably so. But he seems to have uh, forged a very close, close relationship, not just with Alexander-Arnold, but also his teammate Jordan Henderson, a uh, bit of a bromance going on there, which has obviously got uh, tongues wagging and a bit of excitement from Liverpool supporters uh, alongside what has been an avalanche of uh, speculation and rumours about a possible move to uh, Liverpool um, probably uh, at the end of the season as opposed to anything in January. Of course, someone who's as in demand as, as Bellingham is going to have to contend with other teams as well. But what what's the noise on the ground there in Qatar? What, what have you heard? Well, I, I think that Jude Bellingham probably was England's player of the World Cup and that's going to create an issue with his price tag now because uh, Phil McNulty, formerly of this parish, put it very well when he said that his, his value is now ticking up like uh, uh, the dial at a petrol pump and particularly at the moment. And I think he came into this World Cup as one of the world's most promising young players and he leaves it as maybe one, as one of the world's best players because he was superb on and off the field as well. At 19 years of age, he shows so much maturity. I remember watching him commentating for TalkSport when he was a 16-year-old in the Birmingham midfield. And, and as we know, the championship was a hard school and he was dominating games at 16. And he's clearly grown from that during his time at Borussia Dortmund and with England. And he, well, he is a sort of midfielder that would enhance any team now. And I think that certainly he could provide that drive and energy that the Liverpool are looking for. And if the Liverpool players in the England squad have been trying to uh, ingratiate him subtly at the moment, then, then then I think the transfer would be all the better for that. But I think if Liverpool are at the, at the head of the queue, then that's a very good place to be in at the moment because he will be certainly in demand. I'm not sure they're doing it subtly, but... Uh... <laughs> no. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, but uh, they're not the only ones, and unfortunately, a World Cup is a great uh, is a great shot window for players, and and um, we've seen so many Moroccan players now being linked with clubs in the Premier League on the back of how well they played here, and, and of course, we we all knew about Jude Bellingham already, and and I think that 
potential deal with Liverpool may have been in the pipeline for some time for various reasons. But there is no doubt that Dortmund could say now that his value has is, is, is been shot up before the World Cup compared to what it is now. Yeah, we're talking somewhere between 100 and £150 million pounds here, are we? For, for one footballer, it's it's a hell of a lot of money. And, you know, you're always going to run the risk uh, of someone getting injured or something at the start of that. If you, I'm sure you remember the uh, his name escapes me, the guy who signed for AC Milan all those years ago. He was the most expensive player in the world. And he got he was in a car crash. Lentini. That's it, Lentini, yeah. Um, and you run that risk, don't you if, you, if you invest that much money in just one player? You do. Um, Bellingham has had a very good injury record so far. He, he's missed barely any game since he was 16 years of age. But the gamble is, if you don't pay that money, somebody else will. And it could do Liverpool damage further down the line, either in the Premier League or the Champions League. Because there's no doubt that Borussia Dortmund are a selling club. We've seen that with with Alfie uh, with Alfie Harland, not Alfie Harland, Erling Harland uh-huh. um, in, in recent years. And, and it's clear they develop talent. We saw it with Lewandowski as well going to Bayern Munich and they will sell them on for enhanced fees and, and they're prepared to do that with Jude Bellingham now, it seems. So the question is, is he the sort of player that Liverpool need? And I would argue, yes. Well, at the time of recording this podcast, Gareth Southgate is uh, mulling over his position as England manager. I think I think I'm right in saying he's still got two years actually left on his contract. So he, he's not, he does, yeah. He's not obliged to uh, throw the towel in, but of course uh, there are uh, pressures linked with uh, <clears throat> being the manager of the English national team. Um, Jamie Carragher um, caused some debate on Twitter by uh, suggesting that the England manager should always be English. Uh, obviously, he's pointing to if there was a change of manager. There's a few few names that have been linked uh, with the job, Maurizio Potticino, Thomas Tuchel, just to, just to name a couple. Um, that, that's caused a bit of a wide debate, which we'll, we won't go into in too much detail here. But what, what are your own views on that? Do you think the English manager should, or sorry, the England manager should be English or, or should they be looking at other options? I think you need a winner. And I would look close to home as far as England are concerned. You look at the England women's team. They've got Serena Wiegmann, born in the Netherlands as their coach. She was the European champion when they signed her. And she's still the European champion because she guided England to the tournament earlier this year or, or late last year in um, at, at Wembley. So I think you need to go for the best candidate available personally. Ideally, you want someone from the same country. You look at um, a lot of the teams here at the World Cup. They've done it with coaches who are born in that country or certainly are, are, are nationals from that country. Uh, it, was, it was a French-born coach in charge of Morocco, but he's got dual nationality and played for the country as well. So you would take an English coach, but you could also say who is around, who is available. And at the moment, Pochettino is available. Now, it would be a pretty big leap for the English FA to appoint an Argentinian as the manager, bearing in mind that the footballing history between the two countries. But Pochettino has shown himself to be a good coach. But you need to look at the balance. Who would be a good international manager? Because I think the qualities between international management and club management are very different. I think Southgate has proved it beyond any question to be a very good international manager, having not had a fantastic career as a club manager. And I think, personally, he should stay. Having got to know him a bit when I covered England a few years ago around the last World Cup, I think he's tremendous. And I think he's ideally suited for that job. So, yeah, if you can name a good English manager who would take the job and is available, then fine. But I personally, I don't see any problem in looking further afield. Is the key with Southgate continuity then? Because he's, he's, he's probably looked... He's looked settled in the job and obviously he has had heat from the press, but not like anything we saw with Robson or Taylor or, or Capello. You know, it, it, it does feel like a different ball game. Does that just make him a perfect fit for the role? I think it does. and But I think at the same time, he, he does have, you know, the strain of the job and the pressure of the job. And I think that the, the longer it's gone on, the more that becomes an issue. Because I think you look back on the Euros... I think that was a missed opportunity. They got to a final there. They were leading that final into the second half and they didn't win it. Once again, England lost on penalties. And maybe that was the one that got away 
Not so much the World Cup in 2018, because I think England got a lot further than maybe that squad was capable of doing, but it was Southgate who got them there. This is a different situation. I think that he's, he's ingratiated more younger players into the team and they've lost to the world champions. They could lose to the team that could retain the trophy. So I think there's no shame there. But there will always be people saying England could be doing better. And I think Southgate's entitled to turn around and say, OK, find someone. And I don't think they could necessarily find someone who's available, unless you're going to go down the Pochettino or a Tuchel route. And if you're going to appoint an Argentinian or a German to the role, then all the best if England lose a couple of games. <laughs> I think you've probably hit the nail on the head there, to be honest, Nigel. Um, well, let's look ahead to tonight then. I'm not at all jealous, but you're at tonight's uh, World Cup semi-final, France v Morocco. And I believe you, I think you were at uh, France's training session uh, yesterday evening, weren't you? No Deo uh, Upamecano in the training. I understand that he's had a sickness bug. Uh, that could potentially create an opportunity for Liverpool's Ibrahima Kanate, who's had limited involvement in the World Cup, but uh, who I can tell you from close quarters uh, has been uh, in exceptional form for Liverpool since he returned to the first team fold. How, how realistic do you think his chances are of being involved tonight? I think very good at the moment because Upa Makana was missed two days training with this sickness bug. Adrian Rabio was also missing yesterday as well. So Kanate would be the natural replacement at the moment. Of course, he played in that game against Tunisia where the, effectively a B team was picked by Didier Deschamps. And no one in that team really did themselves too many favours when they were beaten by a goal to nil and, and well beaten by the Tunisians in the end. But a lot of people, even before the sickness bug, have been questioning Upa Meccano's place in the team because he has been a bit rash at times. He almost gave away a penalty in the game against England the other day. And people are wondering why Upa Meccano hasn't been given more of an opportunity. This could be his chance tonight. And if it is, Liverpool fans, I'm sure, would say this could be a great opportunity for him and he would deserve it. They do have other options. They could bring uh, Benjamin Pavard back into, into the team and move Jules Koundé into the heart of the defence. But Pavard has been bombed out after the first game and has not been seen since. And Didier Deschamps has at times suggested it, it may be a, a mental issue, which has led to his lack of involvement. So so Canate could get his opportunity again in a World Cup semi-final. Yeah, it's funny how these stories can go, can't it? He's had very little involvement in the uh, competition, really, like, like Trent Alexander-Arnold. But... but could find himself right in the mix of things at the business end. It'd be quite a story. So well, let's just have a little look ahead. So uh, some of the other players that have uh, starred at the World Cup that uh, have been linked with Liverpool in the last week. So I'm talking about um, Enzo Fernandes of Argentina, uh, Sofyan uh, Amrabat, easy for me to say. Uh, and I'll also throw uh, Mohamed Kudus in, into the mix as well, but he was, he was a player who I saw play for Ajax earlier in the season in a more attacking role, but seems to prefer playing this sort of midfield berth uh, for Ghana. What, what do you think of those players? Uh, one you'll get to see tonight. Uh, and how do you rate the chances of any of them ended up at Anfield next month? Well, starting with Amrabat, I think he'll be in the Premier League or certainly at a, at a really big club very soon. His agent is actually staying in the same hotel as me. So clearly, maybe he's trying to... Um, get him a move as quickly as possible. He's playing for Fiorentina, does pick up a lot of bookings, nine, I think, in, in Serie A so far this season. But he has been magnificent here for Morocco. He has been a driving force. So much energy for them throughout this tournament. And he, he's been the heartbeat of the team. And if you could maybe for a second imagine a midfielder, Bellingham and Amrabat at some stage, that would be something moving forward for any team. And, and I think that he, he is going to be heading to a very big club. And I think that he is a classic World Cup shop window player, but he could justify it on, on, on his performances so far. Kudus, I think, is another really good player. I've seen him play for Ajax as a number nine this season, scored plenty of goals in the Eredivisie. I know we're talking levels between the Eredivisie and the Premier League, but he's a young player who I think is capable of the step up. He's only really been involved with Ajax on a regular basis this season because other players, of course, have, have moved on around him. Uh, Anthony, notably, was somebody who departed, so Kudus has been brought into that team. But he is somebody who, again, 
just has that hunger and has the hunger to learn. He's shown that with Ajax and he's also been a main player for Ghana. And you know, they were pretty unlucky in the end not to to maybe get out of the group stage, but that wasn't for lack of trying. And Enzo Fernandez, I've seen play for Argentina. I was in the stadium doing the commentary when he scored that great goal against Mexico in the game, which turned things around for Argentina in the group stage. And I think inevitably he's been in the shadow of Messi because everyone in the Argentinian team has been in the shadow of Messi so far. But at the same time, I think he's clearly somebody that Messi trusts to, to get on the ball around him and try and make things happen. And, and he's an, another midfielder with an eye for goal. And I think that they're worth their weight in gold at the moment. Yeah, Benfica obviously know what they're doing when it comes to uh, acquisition, don't they? Because they seem to make a living off um, identifying South American talent, bringing them in, nurturing them in a very short space of time and then turning a profit on them. Because you, you'd think, uh, if you're a Benfica supporter, would you be of the mindset being quite annoyed that these top European clubs come in and poach your players all the time. But it's almost like an accepted rite of passage. A bit like Ajax in many ways. It's the way things are. If you're if you're a massive club in a relatively small league in terms of finances, it is always going to happen. And of course, Darwin Nunez moved on to Liverpool. Gonzalo Ramos came into the team. And now he's a World Cup star, of course. that They've gone home already, but he scored that hat-trick. Kept Cristiano Ronaldo out of the team for the last couple of games in the tournament. And who knows, Gonzalo Ramos could be the next cab off the rank of Benfica moving on for big money. But it's it's the way it is for, for, cl- for clubs like that. And, and they just do a, a really good job in their scouting network. It, it is really, really good in South America. They've had a number of South American coaches there in recent years as well. And, and, and I think the links they've built up really produce fruit and, and some very expensive fruit at times. Interesting that you said that uh, Amrabat's uh, agent is staying in your hotel there. I don't know how thin the walls are uh, in the hotel <laughs> rooms there, but uh, I, I don't know if you've heard Jürgen's laugh coming through his uh, his mobile phone or anything, any 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 whisperings of anything going on there? Not yet, but I'm sure his phone will be red hot at the moment and he, he won't be the only Moroccan player on the move fairly soon. Uh, their midfielder... Uh, Azazin Unahi plays for Angers, who are bottom of Ligue 1 at the moment. But he's only 22 and he has been, another player has been superb. And the Angers owner has been saying over the last couple of days that his phone's been ringing off the hook as well. So I think there'll be a number of players who will will be moving on on the back of this World Cup. And Liverpool's recruitment in the whole has been very good in the last few years. And it's whether they look at a World Cup performance and think is that something that they can really base a big money transfer on and do you gamble in January on the back, on the back of something that's happened here in Qatar it's, it's a difficult balancing act well hopefully Morocco will beat France tonight and uh, the overexcited agent will give out a bit more information than he was supposed to but we'll uh, I'll leave that in your capable hands Nigel we'll do, just just to finish off then just looking at uh, the bigger picture of Liverpool obviously they've had a pretty underwhelming start to the season uh, uh against the bar that they've set themselves in recent seasons. Um, a chance to reset, an unusual chance to reset in the in, in, in the middle of a campaign. Um, but a lot of work to do if they're going to finish in the top four uh, and do it comfortably as well, even though they're still obviously fighting on four fronts. So um, what's your sort of outlook as to how Liverpool might do in this second half of the season? As you say, it's going to be hard work to make the top four. It's going to be similar to that run we saw a couple of years ago when it seemed they were out of the race. And then I think they won, was it five games in a row at the end, maybe even a longer run than that to, to finish third in the end. And and then Jurgen Klopp was saying, look, it's the thrill of the chase. And of course they got players back fit like Thiago at the right time. And, and that just gave them those added ingredients to get themselves over the line. And, and it's I don't think they scored a header as well, of course. Yeah, it, it helps when Alisson comes forward and scores in, in added time at the Hawthorns. Um, and Alisson's another player who'll be coming back from the World Cup, having had very little to do. But of course, he, he's left early. I mean, he barely had a shot to save uh, for Brazil and then was beaten by that late deflection in the match against Croatia. So, yeah, certain things went their way and Liverpool will need a lot of things to go their way to make the top four. And... Do they go into the market with that in mind on the basis of what's happened here in the World Cup? Or do they think longer term? 
it's it's a difficult one, isn't it? Because clubs like Liverpool, they've got to be in the Champions League season in, season out. And that's clearly going to be the minimum requirement in the remaining six months or so in the season. And do you think with that in mind that there is big pressure in terms of getting this whole sale of the club right, whether it is actually an outright sale to a, you know, a rich Arab state or someone of similar status or just keeping the reins with FSG and bringing in some sort of major player as an investor? It is. I think it's got to be right for the fans as well, because I think Liverpool fans, maybe more than than other fans of, of big clubs, would look at the investors and look behind the investors and and try and see where the money is coming from and, 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 and how that money has been earned. Now, do you eventually say, look, if it's going to win us trophies, it doesn't matter. I, I don't think Liverpool fans uh, are, are wired up like that. And being out here in the Middle East, you you hear and see lots of big hitters from various Middle East states talking about the potential of the Premier League. And it wouldn't surprise me if Qatar bought the Premier League club fairly soon because they've had the infrastructure built here for the World Cup, which in terms of infrastructure has been a success. And would they dip their toe into to club football, either in the Premier League or elsewhere? Of course, they, they have uh, you know investments with Paris Saint-Germain. Would they look to the Premier League? And, and there are other areas as well, which are clearly are cash rich. And that would be attractive to, to many, many club owners. So, it, again, we use that phrase balancing act, but I think for Liverpool, it, it has to be right on and off the field. And I think that very few Liverpool fans, the actual core Liverpool fans, would say, look, we don't care. We'll quite happily wear anyone's national dress if it, if it means we're going to buy somebody brilliant in January and we're going to win the title. I think Liverpool fans have uh, made a sterner stuff. We shall see what happens. Uh, Naj Adley, thank you very much for taking the time to join us from Qatar today. Most appreciated. Enjoy the game this evening. Cheers. Thanks a lot, Richard. No worries. That's all from uh, Blood Red Podcast for now. Uh, keep checking the YouTube channel for the latest news on Liverpool and also the Liverpool Echo website. Have a good day.